The Tom Woods Show, episode 1995. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show, it's time to go to the next level. And next level Tom Woods is libertyclassroom.com. This is where my friends and I teach all the stuff you did not get in your conventional education, history, economics, and more, the way it ought to be taught with all the content they left out or distorted. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Well, I had a bit of a problem last week. My trusty Mac started making a funny squeaking noise, and we think it might be the fan in there, so we're going to get that fixed. But in the meantime, I also had to go to the Mises Institute Supporters Summit and speak there. So there was just no way for me to get away and get myself a temporary computer, which I am operating on right now, by the way. I am operating on a temporary computer until I can get the original one fixed. But that just meant I didn't have a full week of episodes. But there was honestly nothing I could do. There was no way I could solve that problem. But we are back and running again. And I want to share with you today something that I think at first we imagined we would keep just confidential for people who were in the room, but we've decided, what the heck, let's make it into a Tom Woods show episode after all. So what I'm sharing with you was the evening conversation that Mises Institute President Jeff Deist and I had at the most recent Supporters Summit, October 2021, for the Mises Institute. And it was called, the session that is, What Must Be Done Revisited. And it's a reference there to Hans Hoppe's essay or address that was published as an essay some years ago, I think back in 1997, called What Must Be Done. So we were revisiting that for 2021. But just as a jumping off point, we had a lot more to say than just that. And all kinds of topics you love hearing discussed are in there. And in the middle of the thing, this was held in uh, St. Pete Beach in Florida, at a resort or a hotel called the Don Cesar. And they were wonderful. It was a, it's a beautiful place and many, many good things to say about it. But the employees were all walking around masked. And you will note that partway through this, I address that with those folks in the room. This was the dessert was being served after the dinner and these masked workers are in the room and I made rather a stirring call. So Enjoy that, everybody. Here we go. So first and foremost, thank you. Uh, we are entirely off the record this evening. No holds barred. This is, this is me and Old Woods here. <laughs> and whatever you have to say as well. So almost 25 years ago, some of you were there in Newport Beach, California. Hans Hermann Hoppe gave a talk called What Must Be Done? And it, it followed very much in the vein of strategy talks uh, the late Murray Rothbard wrote a lot about strategy. He wrote a lot of memos for the Volcker Fund. Uh, he wrote about prospects for left and right. So he was known for talking about strategy. And Professor Hoppe picked that up in this talk. And what's so interesting about it is that if you read it, and frankly, this applies to a lot of what Hoppe writes, it has no period feel to it. In other words, other than on the very last page of this, he makes a fleeting reference to Waco, which had occurred, I guess, in 93 or thereabouts. So that would sort of temporalize this and make you realize the era in which he was writing about. Apart from that, he could have stood up here and delivered this word for word today. And I think it would have read just as well today as it did then. So with those 25 years of hindsight to benefit from, I mean, George W. Bush hadn't even entered office yet. The wars in Afghanistan, 9-11, the financial crisis of 07, none of that had happened. You know, we ask ourselves, what must be done? Well, a lot of tonight's going to be my opinion and Tom's opinion on that. My opinion is that what lies ahead and what must be done is going to be thoroughly unpleasant and potentially harmful to a lot of people in this country. I don't think it has to be violent or bloody, but I think it has to happen. So when we talk about ideas, intellectual battle, what, you know, winning people's hearts and minds, some of you might have seen this just a year or two ago, in 2019, a survey was performed in the former Soviet Union, and it found that about 70% of Russians have favorable attitudes towards Stalin and his place in history. They still see him as a reformer, a modernizer, a, 
a figure in their country who helped them win World War II. So the point here is that, is our job persuasion or is our job separation? I think at some point that's the question we have to ask ourselves because we like to think that ideas run the world. In a sense, they do, or lack of ideas. In other words, ad hocism, lurching around without any ideas or ideology is sort of an idea unto itself. But if we say ideas run the world, maybe that's true, but they're transmitted through living men and women. Right? So men and women run the world, and men and women have interests, self-interests. So when we say, you know, why is it so difficult for us? It seems like uh, people who see the world like us, who have sensible political and economic views, you know, what are we, 5 or 10% of the population? And we'll get to that later, because that's plenty, by the way. But, you know, we're 5 or 10% of the population, and, and it's so hard to break through. And year after year, we find people falling for the same old political lies, the same old economic fallacies. We never seem to get ahead. We're still talking about things like full employment. We're still talking about things like tariffs. We're still trying to remake the world. You know, these mistakes just seem to happen over and over again, and we never advance politically. Well, and you say, well, why is that? If we could just explain to people our ideas, if we could just show them, have them be exposed to our ideas, then we could win because it's so obvious and self-evident to us that we're right. But here's the thing. What if a lot of people would be worse off in a more libertarian society? How about, for starters, government employees at all levels, right? A lot of them would be, you know, have a self-interest in maintaining this. But if you think beyond that, I mean, the number of Americans who have an interest in the status quo is very, very large. I mean, there are entire industries which are essentially captured, which are adjuncts to the federal government. We can talk about law. Increasingly, we can talk about medicine. We can talk about education and banking and insurance. These industries employ millions of people, and you know what? They like their paychecks. Uh, how about all the people who have union protections? How about all the big companies which have patent protections? What about all the people who get student loans and go to college till they're 33? <laughs> what about all the people, good people, fine people, who receive Social Security and Medicare entitlements? That's a lot of people with a lot of self-interest. So when we say, you know, it's just a matter of persuasion. If we can just show them our ideas, you know, they'll come around and they'll see that this is clearly a better system. Well, they might not see it so clearly as a better system. So that's, I think, it is important to understand when we, when we read Hoppe or when we talk about what must be done, I think it's important to understand that. And I want to start, Tom, with a theme that he brings up in here, which I think is so prevalent today in spades he talks about the disappearance of natural elites. So in our current society, we have all these huge problems. Apart from COVID, we have all the economic and uh, mental health issues which were caused by the COVID lockdowns. You know, we have all these, what we consider terrible problems in society. And I was talking to Gary Schlarbaum earlier. There's a feeling, almost a sense in America that things are unraveling, right? I mean, there's a sense that things are a little bit out of control. But if you look at our, our so-called elites, and Hoppe points out these tend to be, you know, politicians that become stars, which is a bit uh, unseemly in itself, but also we have pop stars and athletes. And, you know, we have a lot of very moronic people in this country who have huge platforms. And so when we think about this, we think, you know, Joe Biden is the president. If you could go back to the U.S. Senate in the 70s, where they may have been corrupt or evil, but there were real senators. You know, if you talk to a Ted Kennedy or Daniel Patrick Moynihan, if you had told them that Joe Biden, this new guy from Delaware who plagiarized in law school and is a big dummy and, you know, flunked the bar and et cetera, if you had told them, you know, this guy is going to be the president in 40 years, they would have laughed their you-know-what's off. And if you look at Wolf Blitzer, if you look at Jake Tapper, if you look at our our sports and, and pop music celebrities. I mean, these are, these are deeply unserious people in what seems like a deeply serious time. And so we've lost, because of mass democracy, we've lost what Hoppe would consider people of, you know, natural elites for their own talents, abilities, maybe even family birth. And we're left with clowns. Okay, thanks for that introduction. <laughs> uh, I'll say... <laughs> Well, to me, we talk about natural elites. What's interesting is the attempt to substitute 
state-endorsed elites, people who are designated by the state as being worthy of our veneration. And the chief one of those these days is Dr. Fauci. Now, there is a manufactured elite, if there was one. This guy's a boob who clearly does change his mind on things according to political expedience or what he thinks he can get away with. There's no question about this. This isn't some dumb guy right-wing critique of Dr. Fauci. This is, this is clearly through and through. And it was interesting to note that when these people, like a Fauci, get interrogated, the rare occasion where they actually get asked a serious question, it is astonishing how fast they crumble and fold. Now, you ask Hans Hoppe a serious question, he ain't crumbling or folding. But you ask these people a question, they don't know what to do. So, of course, you, I'm sure some of you heard about Sanjay Gupta of CNN going on Joe Rogan. And Rogan asks him, look, why did your network say I was taking a horse dewormer? And he explains, look, a doctor prescribed it for me. This is people medicine. And he even said to uh, Sanjay Gupta, he leaned forward and said, look, I can afford people medicine, blankety blanker, you know? <laughs> and Gupta was very apologetic. Oh, I'll have to talk to them. Yeah, I'm sure for, that'd be first thing on his agenda is get back to CNN and talk to them. But he folded instantly because he's not accustomed to dealing with somebody outside his bubble as a different point of view. Well, likewise, there have been those rare occasions when the Fauci's or the Andy Slavitt's or whoever these people are, they go on the mainstream media. And every once in a while, these reporters will, every once in a while, in spite of themselves, they'll stumble into a challenging question. So for example, Andy Slavitt, another one of these losers, was on MSNBC. And they asked him, this was months ago, well, why does Florida actually have a, I mean, Florida, the only measure that matters is age-adjusted mortality. That's all that matters. You don't just raw compare Florida with California. Florida has obviously and notoriously one of the oldest populations. California has one of the youngest. So when you look at age-adjusted COVID mortality, Florida is among the best in the country. Now, you don't know that because nobody mentions it. Right now, right now, Flo oh, I have something, hold your applause because I have something better. Right now, in the continental U.S., the state with the lowest COVID case rate is Florida. Now, I'm sure our media will get right on that, right? And I would say, by the way, I'm also very pleased with the Don Cesar. I'm very glad. I, I love my room. I love the, the grounds, the surroundings. The, everybody's been wonderful. But I would say, unless this place is being run by some corporate conglomerate based in Los Angeles, I would say Florida may now have less COVID than it'll ever have. I would say unmask these employees. There is no reason for this. Is there anybody in this room who's afraid that one of these employees is going to give them COVID? Anyone? No. Go ahead. Take them off. Take them off. I know you don't want to get fired. We'll go talk to your boss. Anyway, let's get back to our old friend, Andy Slavitt. So he's asked about this. If Florida, which has been very laissez-faire, is doing better than California, which has been like a prison state, don't you have to explain this in some way? Like, at some point, don't we have to account for this? And I kid you not, his answer was, well, there are aspects of this virus that are a little beyond our ability to explain. <laughs> so there's a part of you that thinks maybe these fake elites, you know, maybe they do have some knowledge, right? They had to get where they are somehow. Maybe they do have an answer. And then they ask him these questions, point blank, they have no answer. Fauci was asked when Texas opened up, well, look, it's been months and Texas's numbers have gone way down. Like, how do you account for it? You have to answer this at some point. And his answer was, maybe they're doing a lot of things outdoors. <laughs> I mean, it was like he was answering it with a question mark. I don't, I don't really know. However, let's go full steam ahead with a policy that is increasingly dubious. These are our so-called natural elites in the public health sphere. Now, public health is one of these phrases now you can't say without chuckling, right? You got to put quotation marks around public health. But yes, these are people who on their own merits would not have risen to this level of fame and respect. 
So the divide in America, to me, is between people who, when the state trots out an expert, they automatically flock to that person, and other people who demand to see results first. And I will say this is a division that exists within the libertarian movement. And since we're here and and you guys are some of the biggest supporters the Mises Institute has, I'm not going to walk on eggshells here. I want to be frank with you guys because we can't be frank with you. Whom can we be frank with? Let's say a little something about the libertarian movement because I will – I'd be willing to bet there are people in this room, maybe even myself included, who in the past – might have supported this or that. I'm not going to tell you where to donate your money, except the Mises Institute. But there are places you may have, with the best of intentions, given your money in the past. And those places have failed us spectacularly during COVID. There is part of the libertarian world that's embarrassed by people like us. Oh, you're embarrassing us. You have to listen to the experts like Dr. Fauci, and they'll very grudgingly, maybe grudgingly say that maybe lockdowns shouldn't be compulsory, but blah, 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 masks and blah, 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 all the propaganda that everybody knows is BS, and, they'll, and they're looking for ways to excuse vaccine passports. Some of them are writing articles about how a vaccine passport could be acceptable on libertarian grounds. Unless you know that an organization you've been supporting year after year just through inertia has been rock solid good on this, every last dollar's got to be taken from those people, period, right? All right, back to you, Jeff. Well, we've seen a lot of realignment beginning last year, and it's accelerating now. COVID seems to be going on and on, at least COVID policy. And so I've spoken about this at a couple of other events, some of the happy silver linings to COVID. You know, Hoppe would say that appointed elites or unnatural elites got what was coming to them, which is a a huge loss of credibility, which I think is going to filter through all other aspects of life in a salutary way. But a lot of people decided that they had enough last year and they things in their own personal lives. Millions of Americans in 2020 and into 2021 voted with their feet. Some of you may have seen that United Van Lines, the moving people, did a big survey in 2020. And just as you would expect, people were leaving California, they were leaving New York, they were leaving New Jersey, and they were leaving Illinois in droves. And guess where they were going? Well, they were going to Boise, Idaho, for one. Uh, they were, yeah, uh, Tom Yanks is here. They were going to, they were going to Phoenix, Arizona. They were going to Tennessee and Florida and Texas. Uh, we're going to cordon off Austin with a, a, a biosphere <laughs> because we're, we don't want that to be like the Wuhan lab and release anything. But believe it or not, Alabama was number seven on that list of net immigrant states. So that's, that's very interesting to me, Tom. The other thing that was interesting to me is that not only did homeschooling explode last year, this is a very, very, very unfortunate fact for the narrative, which is that the fastest growing segment of homeschoolers is black folks because they got the worst schools. So that's going to be an incredibly difficult thing for our, uh, our would-be superiors to talk down. They're also among the most least vaccinated group in America, which is another interesting fact. Quitting college, quitting college became a thing last year when, you know, uh, parents started to figure out, you know, what are we paying for this Zoom class? You know, and if we've got a Zoom class from State U for 40 grand a year, for 40 grand a year, why, if it's going to be via Zoom, why don't we just have the best professor on earth in this subject? rather than the professor who happens to work at my state U. So that strikes me as interesting. But my favorite thing, Tom, about last year and this year that we've seen praxis on is that we started to see real identification among states. We, we actually saw governors of states sniping at each other on Twitter. And I thought that was a beautiful thing to see. So what, tell us about that, Tom. Well, well, another governor thing that was interesting to me to note is that when Trump was still in office and he was threatening to open up these states against the wills of the governors, suddenly they discovered the 10th Amendment that says you can't do that, right? We can keep our states as close because that's the way James Madison would have wanted it, I guess, or something like that. But yeah, I mean, of course, Gavin Newsom has had a field day criticizing uh, DeSantis 
Governor Cuomo criticized Ron DeSantis. And I will say that reminds me of something in the Hoppe essay. He says, look, the whole system of democracy is immoral and stupid and leads to terrible outcomes. He says, but there are isolated cases where there happen to be concentrations of sensible people in particular areas where you can use the existing system and get a sensible person elected. Uh, because you, you, know, you may need to do that to usher in the kind of society that you want. And I think in this particular case, now, he is, he's not good on everything. I totally understand that. But we're not seven years old. We have to be capable of looking, having a bird's eye view of the world historic significance of the time we're in right now. And let me say that DeSantis, who has been, uh, who has moral and intellectual pygmies have spent the last year and a half attacking him, he's got to be rallied to consistently. Because understand the significance of what he's done. He has stood up against everybody. He's stood up against the world health bureaucrats who obviously have no idea what they're doing. That's obvious with the different masking requirements and this and that. And I made a series of charts. I don't know if you saw this, but I made up a quiz because I'm sick and tired of seeing this and no one knows it. You look at California in the past couple of months. You look at Arizona the past couple of months. You graph hospitalizations, deaths, whatever you want. California's crazy for masks. Arizona hasn't had its mask mandate for a while. And you notice that the trajectory in both cases is identical. Now, if the masks were doing anything, it should be clear. They shouldn't be identical. They should be diverging like crazy. And this is happening all over the country, all over the world, case after case. So I made up a quiz involving masks, lockdowns, and and I'll give you the chart and I'll say, all right, here's a couple of states or here are a couple of countries. And one of them did this and one of them did that. Uh, One of them engaged in policies that ruined people's lives, decimated their savings, destroyed their livelihoods. So... The state that didn't do that, well, surely their numbers must be through the roof, right? Because that'd be the only thing that would justify these interventions. Go ahead, pick which one you think is which. And you're always wrong. You fail this quiz every time. You're always wrong. I have a thing from last Thanksgiving, and it's the Midwest during Thanksgiving. But I don't show you where Thanksgiving is on the graph. I just say, where do you think Thanksgiving is? Because we were all told we get together for Thanksgiving, everyone's dead. Okay, so you figure Thanksgiving must be right about here and because after Thanksgiving, you know, of course, the numbers should rise because we all infected everybody. And what, so, so Thanksgiving should be about there. Thanksgiving's nowhere near there. Thanksgiving's down here. Why is that? Why is it? Because none of it does any good, apparently. I don't know why it doesn't do any good, but apparently it doesn't. And so, I, so if you're interested in looking at it, it's COVID charts with an S quiz.com. COVID charts quiz. Send it to your friends and see how they do. And they'll make all the excuses in the world. Oh, well, you're comparing the reason we can't compare this place with that one. Okay. Did you, re- we shouldn't even have to be making all these little nuanced caveats here because think back to when Florida opened up in, in uh, the fall of 2020. When Florida opened up, People were screaming that it would be the end of the world. Screaming. And then when it turned out not to be the end of the world, I started getting comments like this on Twitter. Well, I'm looking at Florida's numbers. They look pretty average to me. I guarantee you, when Florida opened up, as a resident of Florida, I guarantee you, people were not saying, if Florida opens up, your results are going to be very average. (laughs) No one was saying that. They were saying mass death. Very average, even though we're actually much better than very average. Very average is a huge victory. We didn't do anything and we're still very average. (laughs) So anyway, I don't go for all this, well, the reason you can't compare this state with that. No, 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 no. A place like Sweden should be, if these measures were justified that destroy society, Sweden should be a thousand times worse everywhere else. Not a little bit worse than the other Scandinavian countries, but still way better than Spain and England and what it should be a thousand times worse. And it's not. And they can't just admit that we made a huge mistake. Now, some of them didn't make a mistake. Some of them are just power hungry, crazy people, but other people genuinely thought this stuff was going to work. 
And since they can't admit that none of it did any good, they have to just keep imposing it until who knows when. We don't know when because they have no metrics. Well, a couple of thoughts about that. First, if things keep going the way they are and DeSantis is a, perhaps a viable contender in the next presidential election, I would, I would look for him to have a, a scandal arise somehow. Someone will find something in his past. But, you know, but that said, it's not really about DeSantis. What, I think what's interesting to note here is that with or without DeSantis, just the natural migration of people into Florida last year created, in, in effect, the genesis of what Hoppe calls, um, he calls them implicitly seceded territories. So what we're finding is that people are voting with their feet in a form of soft secession, in a form of de facto secession, and they're creating liberated communities communities that are expressly secessionist. They have, you know, open noncompliance with the feds. And what we've seen, you know, in just the last couple of weeks with some of these pilot walkouts and the air traffic controllers, American Airlines Southwest, we've seen some school districts where parents were holding them out. And I, you know, somebody commented on the radio the other day, I saw something that was very interesting. They said, it's been something like a month and a half since Biden made his big announcement about the 100 employee mandate and nothing's been done on it since. It's almost like it was a trial balloon or a feeler because supposedly OSHA was going to promulgate these regulations and all these 100-person or more companies were going to have to abide by it. It was going to be a federal edict. Uh, a lot of CEOs, including, I think, the Office Depot guy, uh, came out and said, well, we're not going to do that. And so it, it's interesting that Biden, you know, whatever you know, torpid activity is happening in his brain has enough sense to, you know, to feel, or maybe people, people around him to feel like there's some pushback. And, and the pushback, I think, is critical to avoiding some of the nastiness that we think may be coming. Because, you know, I, I have a theory that, well, not a theory. I mean, I have an observation. And if progressives of all parties, by the way, if progressives believe in anything, it's that there's a natural deterministic arc to human history, and it's a happy one, and that the future is always better and the past is always retrograde. And so Hillary Clinton was the next president of the United States and the first female president of the United States. And this was just part of that progressive arc of history. So when that didn't happen, and I don't think Trump was some kind of plan. I think he just shocked him and came out of nowhere and they thought they'd gotten lucky with this uh, orange uh, TV uh, reality show guy and that you know, Hillary Clinton was going to trounce him versus a, a Scott Walker or something in, in Wisconsin. And so that didn't happen. And I think that in the progressive psyche, ever since then, there's been basically a, a psychological coping mechanism that says this couldn't have happened, this didn't happen, no rational country would allow this to happen. Hillary Clinton was the next president, damn it. This crazy orange man fascist Nazi is president, this cannot be. So that means, you know, Russia... That means deplorables. That means January 6th with an insurrection. That means, you know, anybody who doesn't believe in COVID masks or vaccines is, you know, a, a deplorable, a fascist. So I think a lot of this is just a big psychological cope by progressives. I think that's the way to understand it. And so, you know, when you get pushback, pushback in the form of Brexit, pushback in the form of Donald Trump winning against all odds, whatever form that takes, I think that pushback creates a little disequilibrium for progressives. And what we want to do more than anything, and again, I mean progressives of all parties. I don't want to you know, fall into a left-right thing here, but when we have pushback, when we threaten their sense of inevitability, when they say, gosh, there's, there's maybe more of these deplorables than we thought, and they're not dying off quite as fast as we thought, you know, that's the way we compel them. We put the fear of God in them, the fear of loss into them. So they start to say, hey, maybe we should start cutting some bargains so that California can live more under the rules it would like to right here and now and, you know, let uh, retrograde Alabama have their abortion bans or whatever down there, those rednecks, right? Because right until their Hillary Clinton election, and, and maybe even still, there's some of this, they were so sure that they were going to win everything. When you're winning, why negotiate? When you're winning, why give up a square kilometer of the United States to these people you, you apparently hate? What a and, European and Jeff is square kilometer. Right. What kind of a, a American are you? A, a, a kilometer. <laughs> so when they think they're winning, they just pour it on. But now we've got them rethinking it a little bit. 
And, and the idea of an implicitly uh, seceded territory, like Florida, I think is the, is the greatest story of 2020. Yeah, totally agreed. Um, I'll say, yes, yay, hooray for the Republic of Florida. I got sidetracked, as I often do when talking about the COVID thing. So I'll just say that on the DeSantis front, I hadn't known anything about him, really. And then when this hit, I watched an event he had with several well-known physicians and professors, Martin Koldorf of Harvard and Jay Bhattacharya, and then Levin, I think, of Stanford and, and maybe one other person. And DeSantis held his own with all of them with no notes. He was making reference to obscure studies off the top of his head. And I thought, wow, this guy is prepared. And that's consistently been the case. I mean, all the, the people who get their opinions from TV screens think DeSantis is a troglodyte who doesn't follow the science. No, if you listen to him, he knows, he knows more of it than all these pygmies put together. He, he's an extremely impressive person. And he's stood up against the health establishment. He stood up against the other governors. He stood up against the White House. He's been incredibly impressive on this. And yeah, there are things I wish he would do more of. There are things I wish he wouldn't do at all. I totally get that. We can get back to that once we get through this particular fight because it's the most important fight of our lives. Now, as Jeff is saying right now, the key thing is decentralization. That is the, the key primary thing we need to be emphasizing. And here again... Here again, we see the stark difference that exists within what we sometimes call, for lack of a better term, the liberty movement. We have the Mises Institute and some you know, fellow travelers of the Mises Institute, and we have other people. And these other people, th their attitude is, well, you talk about secession or nullification, that's kind of Confederate talk, you know, like that's not respectable. We're trying to be respectable over here, okay? And you're embarrassing us. And we're making lots of progress on liberty, okay? And just don't come along with all your crazy radical words because you're going to spoil our... Okay, these people have obviously been a huge failure. I mean, what, what do they do all day? They write policy reports that go in the garbage can, and they're going to lecture us about who's effective and who isn't. They don't want to touch anything that's outside the three-by-five card of allowable opinion. Well, sorry, we're not going to make any progress that way. Not going to make any progress because who's written those opinions? The New York Times, the Washington Post. Why would we confine ourselves to safe topics that they want us to talk about? These are libertarians who want to be able to say to the New York Times, now listen, Mr. New York Times reporter, sir, I'm a respectable libertarian. I stay within the boundaries you've laid out for me. I talk about things like the dangers of Russiagate, things like that. I, I, I keep to my, my sphere, you know, and even when we talk about taxes, I try to talk about tax reform because I know full well that means absolutely nothing will happen. And I know that's the way the New York Times likes it. So I'm going to keep it that way. All right. If you're satisfied with that brand of libertarian, there's a whole bunch of them in Washington, D.C. You can go give a million dollars. But it's not doing us any good. We have to be willing to say the unsayable things because as inclined as we are to think, well, if I don't do it, somebody will come along and rescue us. We are the somebody right here, and we ought to support libertarians who have the guts to come out and say things that are currently unfashionable, but that could be tomorrow's mainstream. When it comes to acting locally, there's a couple points that Hoppe makes, which I think are important. First of all, is how absurd he thinks national politics are, because Washington's so far gone. We all know it's never going to be able to pay entitlements, for example, in, in meaningful terms. It's never going to be able to pay the debt in meaningful terms. And so all of this time and energy and mass psychosis that gets bound up in presidential elections, he says, is a big waste of time. Even the House and the Senate, you know, you really ought to focus things locally because what democracy did was it made it impossible to convert the king. You know, ostensibly in a monarchical system, uh, an intellectual or a cadre of intellectuals could simply uh, change the mind of a single monarch and by doing so radically change that whole society living underneath that monarch. But when you get into uh, mass democracy, which has been ushered into the United States and the West today, you know, you can't just convert the king because look what happened with Donald Trump. Donald Trump couldn't even get his own cabinet to do what he asked them to do, much less the administration 
below him, that 70% of the iceberg, which is below the water line that you, doesn't come and go with various administrations, and by the way, has a nice federal union protecting it. So the idea that you, know, you can elect a president is, is, is I think, or, or should put a lot of energy into electing president, I think Hoppe correctly points out as folly. But the other interesting thing about Washington is that things have gotten financially so crazy that maybe there's an awakening in local localities across America that, hey, you know, this is out of control and we need to be thinking about our own future. In other words, uh, how are we going to pay for all this stuff? How, you know, the federal government spent the last 18 months embarking on a course of, of fiscal and monetary policy, which would seem utterly crazed to any economist from any other era. I mean, the idea that you can simply uh, basically apply what's now called modern monetary theory and, and create money, and because that, that's a sovereign issuer of that dollar, there will always be a market for it. You know, I, I mean, that, that's something if you explain it to a child, they'd say, well, okay, but who, who does the work? Wait, you know, so that, that strikes me as, as fascinating. But, but moreover, in, the, in last year, the calendar year of 2020, the federal government in the United States spent about $7 trillion. And some of that was stimulus and PPP loans, remember those? Enhanced unemployment. So it brought in about 3.5 in taxes. So effectively half of everything the federal government did last year was debt financed, future finance, however you want to put it. So it strikes me, if they can finance half, 50%, why not 80%? Why not 90%? Why are we paying taxes at all? Because when you start to think like that, it, it begins to look a lot more like Switzerland, where you really do have territories, uh, cantons and communes, which are far more independent of the federal government. And in Switzerland, the tax burden is essentially flipped. You, you send about 80% of your taxes to either your local commune or your canton, and only about 20% to the feds. So imagine if that were flipped here. Well, I, I'm pretty sure there is somebody. I wish I could. I bet somebody in the in the room knows the quotation. But there's somebody. I don't know if it was an economist or somebody in the federal government who said uh, some time ago that we don't actually need to collect taxes for exactly that reason. We we collect taxes for social engineering purposes uh, to you know to reward this group and punish that group or whatever. But strictly speaking, we could just so the the whole thing. Like we're all part of an experiment that somebody's having fun playing on us. I wanted to point out just from this, this Hoppe thing, he says, in addition to your point about not worrying about politics uh, on, on a, a high scale, because it's going to be very difficult, uh, and you know, his point in politics is that you might have smaller jurisdictions where there are concentrations of, of decent people where you might have some success, but on a, on a large scale, that's unlikely. He says exactly the same thing when it comes to education. He says, from the insight into the role of intellectuals in the preservation of the current system. So he says that intellectuals are basically part of the problem here. I mean, they, they defend the current system. They benefit from it. They don't know how they'd survive on a genuine free market. He says, it follows that one should likewise expend little or no energy, time, or money trying to reform education and academia from the inside. And in another essay, uh, not this one, but Hoppe says that when dealing with politicians— in general, the appropriate response is simply ridicule, ridicule and laughter. And, and I, think, I think that insight applies to education, that instead of being in awe of these people's credentials, the response should be ridicule, to, to find the really stupid courses that they teach and all that, and indeed laugh at them, not, not let them lord it over us. No, I, I don't respect you at all. In fact, I can't say the name because I didn't ask the person's permission, but let's just say over the summer, I had an opportunity to have lunch with a very prominent medical academic at a top flight school. And he said to me that, and I don't even think his politics are the same as mine, but he's been very good on COVID. And he said, do you know that the most important thing you've done in this whole COVID thing, it's not the charts, it's not the newsletters, it's not the speeches. It's the fact that you have ridiculed the public health establishment, particularly Dr. Fauci. That is of central importance, he said. He said, now, you know, your grandmother who doesn't know any better, you don't necessarily ridicule her. But these people who have misled all these folks, 
these people need to be, again, not just refuted, but ridiculed. And this is a very proper academic who would never do such a thing himself to find out that he's secretly cheering me on for ridiculing these people. He is in his heart a Hans Hoppian, this guy. Hey, everybody, I want to take a quick minute in the middle of this presentation to point out that a lot of people came up to me and said how refreshed and rejuvenated they felt because of this weekend event with people from the Mises Institute, as well as at my 2000th episode recorded a week earlier. They honestly felt renewed being surrounded by like-minded people and affirmed in their ideas. It gave them optimism about the future. Well, not everybody has had the opportunity to attend a rejuvenating event like that. And even if you have, its effects can last only so long. We've had a pretty rough year and a half. And if you're still struggling with that or any other issue, like depression or stress or trauma or anxiety or relationship problems or problems in your family, you can wait for them to resolve themselves or you can take action today. I strongly recommend BetterHelp, which I've used myself. It assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can have video sessions, you can talk on the phone, you can send messages. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. It's convenient, and when you check out the testimonials posted daily on their site, you'll know this thing can help you. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com woods. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash woods. Well, I want to talk about the brief prescription HAPA issues at the end of this essay. Basically gives us three points for what he calls a bottom-up revolution. And even within libertarian circles, this has been a point of contention. You bring up some of these divisions, whether our goal, our job, whether that's intellectual or activist, is, is top-down or bottom-up. And this was a point of contention. There were two views on this between Hayek and Rothbard. Hayek arguing for top-down, where, we, where intellectuals sort of trickle down their ideas, and then second-hand dealers of ideas, you know, newspaper reporters, et cetera, uh, spread them. And Rothbard and Hoppe argue for the opposite. They said, you know, these people, these intellectuals, journalists, they all have a vested interest in the status quo, and they're just too far gone. We need to do this ourselves through our own institutions. And so when we think of that, when we think of Hoppe's prescription for our own institutions, that's, that's a very daunting thing to think about. And I think it's something we all have to ask ourselves in this room, which is a, a few key questions. One of is, you know, what institutions could we build? What could we capture? W which could we reclaim? And then, you know, what lasts? That's really the toughest question of all. What lasts when it comes to, the, uh, you know, the role of all of us as parents or whatever, but also the role of the Mises Institute, what lasts? And, you know, sometimes we find ourselves chasing the news of the day. We're caught up social media or whatever it might be. But if we take a step back and say, you know, what can we do today or what can we begin today that'll provide lasting benefits to our children, our grandchildren when we're gone? That's a harder question, institution building. That doesn't give you that dopamine hit of, of doing something today. And yet it's exactly what our enemies have done so skillfully uh, for, you know, really more than a century, certainly in this country, a century and a half in this country is they've had a long time horizon. So for all of our uh, ridicule progressives, in a sense, they've had exhibited low time preference in their own activism. They were willing to do things like social security, right? In the 1930s, when that was passed, there were something like 18 people paying in for every one beneficiary. And the life expectancy was 63 and be death benefits, benefits began at 65. And now fast forward less than a hundred years since social security has passed, look at it now. They, they created a middle-class entitlement program. Absolutely brilliant. Got every over-65 voter in America, basically. It's a, you know, untouchable. So if you think about that kind of long-term thinking and institution building, that's brilliant. So Hoppe says, you know, we have to do the intellectual work ourselves from the bottom up. It's got to be a bottom-up revolution. And that may be unsatisfying in a sense. Uh, people want to want to have... Uh, things now. We all want to enjoy success now. That's just human nature. But in addition to, uh, you know, Tom's point, which Hoppe stresses throughout, that it, it has to be decentralized. I mean, the idea of a centralized uh, authority uh, or a, a centralized provider of justice 
or a centralized enforcer of law is, is of course, the deadly error uh, in democracy. But, you know, this, this is a really tough thing for people, not only to build institutions, not only have long-term thinking, but to have the guts to speak out forcibly, consistently, you know, emphatically against democracy. That's a very tough thing to do. Democracy has become a cheap synonym for good, for legitimate in the 20th century. It's not good. It's not legitimate. And it doesn't work. It doesn't even produce good results except for an entrenched political class, right? This idea that democracy somehow uh, creates a compromise down the middle and neither side gets everything it wants, but they get some of it. And it's just a way for us to sort of happily get along. You know, that hasn't proven to be the case at all. We're at each other's throats with this mass democracy. I mean, it, it's, it's killing us. The 330 million people is varied geographically, economically, socially, as the United States is. Anchorage, Alaska, and Miami, Florida have to have the same rules. For same Supreme Court's going to decide what, what gun laws or abortion laws you have in those two places. Obviously, this is a recipe for unrest and unhappiness in this country. So I, I think everyone in this room has an obligation to speak against democracy Whenever the, the chance comes up and not, you know, well, we're really a republic or this, that. No, no, uh, you know, that certain things are simply not up for a vote. I think that's one of the toughest tasks for us. Well, it is a tough one, and it's going to make you even fewer friends than all the other ideas we've been talking about tonight. But, <laughs> but everybody in this room is a friend you haven't met yet. Okay, there's an endless supply of us around the world now, thanks to places like the Mises Institute. There's a really good book with a terrible title. Oh, that's the fate of so many good books in this world. Like Hans's own book, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. What a horrible title it is. Hans, you're not here. That's why I have the courage to say this. <laughs> but that's a terrible title. But that is a fantastic book. You'll never look at the world the same way if you read that book. Well, likewise, what was the book I was driving at that has a terrible title? Yeah, mine, of course. Yeah, mine have some of the worst titles of all. Well, okay, I have two things I want to say. I'm getting, I'll get back to that one because I can't remember what was the really bad title book that I wanted to point out to you. But the second thing I want to say involves a guy named Connor Boyack. Now, oh, some of you know him. Okay, good. You should all know him. You'll all know him in just a minute. So some years ago, Connor realized there was a gap out there in terms of material for younger people. Like, we didn't have anything for kids. Like, they're going to go without any material at all, and then when they turn 17, we're going to teach them Hazlitt. Nah, I don't think that's going to be such a good idea. So Connor decided that he was going to develop a uh, children's book series, the Tuttle Twins. And that did pretty well, pretty well, pretty well, pretty well. And then this last year, he sold 1.3 million books. <laughs> and so in addition to that, he's also now producing a cartoon He's also produced a magazine that he sends out with little activities every month for the kids. He's got books for teenagers now. He's got like the equivalent of choose your own adventure books. He's got the resources are unbelievable. And it all happened because not because he was a guy with a billion dollars or he had talents that absolutely no one else on this earth had. He saw there was a gap. And instead of just flailing around and saying, oh, well, I guess that's just our fate. There's just always going to be this gap. He just went and filled it. And so, you know, I spent a little time earlier today talking about some projects that have taken up some of my time. And some of that was a matter of, I felt like, well, geez, all I've been doing is like making videos and stuff and writing articles. And there's, believe me, there's a role for that because that, a lot of those draw people in. But I, then I, but, but what's the practical, what's the thing I can do? And so then it was, well, we obviously need a homeschool program. So we did that. So in other words, you got to think about, well, is there something in my so-called wheelhouse, you know, where there's a gap. We got to start filling these gaps. And this is how we create a kind of parallel society where we don't need them for anything. That should be our aim. Well, before we open up to a, a couple of questions, I'd just like to conclude with this, you know, that I want to bring it back to this idea of, of separation versus persuasion because those are two very different things. And so we have to ask ourselves, where should our energy, our time, our money, our focus be? Should it be on converting the king? Should it be on converting 330 million people 
to read 900 page books? Or should it be on finding those people who we know and can identify who are like minded? Now, the problem in this, Tom, is, and I guess this is a question for you and the audience is let's say 10% of America is, is reasonably in agreement with us. Well, that's 33 million people. That's a fine country unto itself. That's larger than a lot of European countries. But does it require some sort of geographic concentration? That's the tough question because they're scattered. And so people are trying things like the Free State Project in New Hampshire, obviously. Um, and Florida is becoming it, you know, by itself. You know, that's the best way to get sort of like-minded people together Yeah, uh, is through simply having, you know, good policies. I think there has to be geographic concentration. I don't see how else you do it. And as you said, there's already a move in that direction. Most people who moved over the past year, they understood why they were moving. They don't need to read any philosophical tracts to understand why they were moving. The book, I, I suddenly I lost my train of thought. This is just how boring the title is. I couldn't even remember it, okay? It's really boring. But it's a brilliant guy at the University of Colorado at Boulder, Michael Humer, and he wrote a book called The Problem of Political Authority. Terrible title, okay? But it is a great book because it makes the case for our position, but it makes it not in the traditional way of arguing either utilitarian-wise or arguing from natural rights. He argues almost exclusively, or at least in most of his most vivid parts, through analogies, analogies to people's ordinary lives. And so just something as simple as you go out for drinks with your friends, and there are nine of you, and the other eight decide that you're going to pay for the drinks. Why? Because they're eight, and you're one, and they voted. Now, you instantly know that this is, this is wrong. I mean, well, look, I have rights just because there are eight of you and I'm only one. I still have rights. But, hey, wait, we held a vote, and haven't we all decided that that's the highest moral principle? We held a vote. So then you say this, well, do you all understand the problems now with this principle? And they'll come back and, oh, but we all signed a contract. And, oh, yeah, show me. Show me what I signed. If I go to buy a house, we have a day called closing day where you just sit there for an hour and you sign documents and you just sign them and sign them. You don't even know what you're signing. You're signing them and signing them and signing them. All you know is that when I finally put that last signature on there, I got myself a house. Meanwhile, this relationship here where I supposedly agreed to something or I implicitly agreed to it or I would have agreed to it if I'd been asked or whatever all the BS explanations they come up with to justify this is, there isn't a single thing I signed. And yet these people claim they can recruit me into the army and send me into war and they can take as much money of mine as they want and they can tell me what I can consume or whatever. And I didn't sign anything? No, sorry, that doesn't work. This is no different from the people at the bar saying that you're going to pay for their drinks. No different. Just because we have elections or whatever, what does that create? Magic dust? And the magic dust falls on the people we elected and suddenly they have extra powers? This is all crazy superstition. So, yeah, if push comes to shove and you find yourself in an argument about this, yeah, go, go through guns blazing because it'll be the first time anybody's ever heard any dissident voices. And the more of those we have, the better. All right, you ready to open her, open her up? Well, I want to take about... Uh... We'll do about 10 or 15 minutes of questions before we retire to the bar. Uh, I'm going to give Joey a mic. And do we have a second mic somewhere? Yeah, right over here. So please raise your hand for a mic. I think it's really important to re when you were talking about raising up from the grassroots that we realize that there are lots of African-American black people who are feeling completely disenfranchised by the current regime. And I'd like to know what we can do to help African-American communities reconnect their fathers to their children. This is a huge need and something that I think is greatly appreciated in the black community. Well, first of all, this has to start with the black middle class going and doing something about it. Instead of saying, thank God I got out of this dysfunctional neighborhood, now I don't have any, any responsibilities. Kind of you do, or it would be nice if you acted as if you did. And secondly, it's up to a lot. Of, it's, the black churches have to be much more out in front about this. I mean, a lot of times when you say we have problems in our community, the response you get is maybe we do, but we can't talk about them in front of white people. It's got to be only behind closed doors. No, at this point, it's got to be a matter of it's an urgent situation and we all just have to face it and we all have to work together. If you walk down the corridors of a lot of inner city schools, and you see what it's like, you realize that this is not a matter of, well, they didn't get as much funding. 
they get an, an enormous amount of funding. In Washington, D.C., what, what is it, like 20 grand a kid per year? What? 20 grand? And this is what you have to show for it? And they're barely at, what, a seventh grade level if they're lucky when they graduate? So this is not a matter of we haven't voted them enough money or there aren't enough sinecures for the teachers or whatever. That, that ain't it. There isn't a political solution here. The political solution could be stop doing the political things that are hurting them. But in terms of helping, well, part of our whole message is that we can't be messianic about what politics can accomplish. There are other things that have to be done culturally and socially apart from the state. And these are things that we in this room can't coordinate. And even if we tried, you know, if I lived in the black community and a bunch of people who spent the weekend at the Don Cesar came and told me how to live, I think I'd ignore them. So it has to come from within, I think. So for uh, my generation, Generation Z, the most popular economist isn't Paul Krugman or Keynes. It's Richard Wolff, who's a pro-Soviet radical socialist. So as we see the younger generation turning more towards radical socialism, what are some strategies that you think are very important? Well, for one thing, I would remind at every possible opportunity, I would remind young people of who did this to them over the past year and a half. It wasn't us. I think about those kids in Connecticut who played high school football and they were being told you can't have your high school football season because COVID. You know, because we're all following the science up here. And they had a, a massive demonstration chanting the words, let us play. And apparently it didn't do them any good. I would remind every one of those kids, who did this to you? Who took a simple but beautiful little pleasure away from you that's irreplaceable? Now you lost a year. It's irreplaceable. Who took that from you? Wasn't us. It was the affable socialist over there. That guy, you know, the one who's trying to win you back by saying he'll raise the minimum wage a little bit for you. Well, we have a little bit more ambition for you than just getting you a higher minimum wage. All right. We want you to have a better society all around that can never torture you again. How's that? So that'd be my first message. Well, I would have your friends look at watch the Gene Epstein versus Richard Wolf debate at the Soho Forum for a, a, a brief education, a real smackdown. How do you... I, I, I've obviously thought about this a lot, as I'm sure everybody here has on succession and all that are breaking up in fractions. How do you overcome the monopoly on violence that the government has and the state, state has? Well, the state house is presumably easier to capture than D.C. And the city hall is presumably easier to capture than, I don't mean physically capture, I mean capture politically than the state house. So it's an imperfect approach, certainly, there are better and worse states. We've seen that in spades over the last year. There's better and worse countries. I mean, God help anybody who's in Australia or New Zealand for the last year, or China for that matter. So I think the idea that there's a monopoly on violence, well, that's true. And in 1985, if you had told anyone in the former Soviet Union that that monopoly would crumble a few years hence, they probably would have, would have laughed you out of the room. So it's a matter of, of chipping away at these things. Um, and having the kind of long time horizon that, that it might require. But look, none of us wants to be that person who goes to city council meetings on a Tuesday night at 7.30 to talk about a viaduct, right? But you know who does go to those Tuesday evening meetings to talk about? Earnest, middle IQ progressives. They live for that stuff. They eat it up. They'll do that for 10 years and then they'll run for state house. And they'll do that for 10 years. And then an absolute mediocrity, uh, just, uh, you know, a oatmeal in skin <laughs> will become your congressman or congresswoman. You see it all the time, all the time. And so the question is, is um, who wants to do the work, I guess? Hi, guys. In uh, Dr. Hoffa's original uh, essay, he uh, lays out a lot of details how we can actually move from the ground up, which is brilliant. And I find a stumbling block, which I'm not able to resolve in my own mind, and I'm hoping that you guys can give us either the details of making it work or maybe a work around it, where he's talking about restricting voting in your little community of like-minded individuals, restricting voting only to property owners or uh, 
taxpayers, so to speak, and eliminating um, tax consumers from the vote. You know, in today's world in the United States, where you've got state constitutions that have provisions against voting restrictions and the federal constitution, which also has provisions of voting restrictions, how could we actually make that happen? Well, I think you ignore the federal and state constitutions the way they ignore them. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you know, when you say, how can you make this happen? It's the question is, what can they do about it? Right? And you reach a critical mass where if, if you know, Hoppe talks about, well, it was easy to attack what he calls a tiny group of freaks at Waco. And we all remember that catastrophe, which is an absolute crime for which Janet Reno should be in prison, uh, by the way. You know, uh, you, you, have some, you have some kooky religious beliefs and you might have some kids in your compound and we can't wait for you to just come into town and question you. But, you know, in a situation like Waco, it was easy both politically and from a PR perspective to demonize those people and literally incinerate them. But when you get into a situation where you have the bulk of a population in a city or in a town and you have some of the more established people, I think that becomes a different question. And that's, that's what Hoppe talks about. So the first thing you do is you take the vote away from Wolf, okay? And any professor like that, they're, they're the first people we have to talk to. But when, when it comes to, you know, having the courage to speak out against democracy, I mean, this is the kind of thing you have to say. You know, Hoppe wouldn't say, well, we need to take the vote away from public officials so to speak, you'd say, no, we just have to take it away. We have to take the vote away from these people. They're, they're not allowed to vote to take our money and give it to themselves. I mean, that's a harsh thing, but it, it's necessarily harsh, I think. If you're on the receiving end, and like if you're in a profession that is publicly funded, then you, there's kind of a conflict of interest for you to be voting on exactly how much of my money you're going to take. So that was what he had in mind, was specifically certain groups. And, and that would include, um, you know, that could, that could be naturally left-wing and naturally right-wing people. It's not even the principle. It's the matter of if your profession is publicly funded, then you can't be deciding just, it's bad enough your hand's in my pocket already. You don't get to decide how much you're going to be taking. No. Uh, yes. Yeah, so how do you see a decentralized uh, approach succeeding when uh, it's up against uh, much of society, which is based on the network effect? Well, I mean, first of all, Hans's essay talks about uh, a small place starting it. And then another small place looks at that first small place and thinks, well, why can't we live like that? I mean, they have a kind of society that we sort of want. Why don't we do that? And then the network effect begins because then another place, before anyone has even had time to respond to the first two places, thinks, well, why don't we do that? What are we, a bunch of losers? We're not from a different species than these other people. Why don't we do it? And then it begins to, it multiplies that way. But also... I mean, we already have a federal system in the United States. And I have to say, I thought it was completely moribund until last year. And COVID reminded us that it's actually much more alive than we realize. I mean, for now of all times, for us to be pessimistic about decentralization seems odd to me. I mean, you just saw that Joe Biden practically wanted to close the border to Florida. And DeSantis just, just stared him down. And DeSantis won. You know, so this kind of thing's happening all the time. So, so I'm not nearly as, I mean, and I am, you know, I've kind of, I have attached myself to so many hopeless causes o over the years. You know, I'm, I'm accustomed to just never winning anything. So for me to feel optimistic about something, there must be something to it. But likewise, we, we have, seen, there are many cases of, of you know, even if, if only in, in modest areas of different states saying, well, we're not going to follow this particular federal order. We're not going to do this. We're not going to do that. We just accentuate that and highlight that and say, look, this is happening all over the country. Before Trump supported a federal right to try law, there were a lot of states that were saying, well, why should the FDA make it impossible for a terminally ill patient to try a potentially life-saving drug? I mean, shouldn't they at least have the option to try? So they were just doing it. They're just doing it regardless. So there are a lot of examples of resistance. I mean, if you, all you have to do is go to the 10th Amendment Center website, Mike Meharry was talking about today, and you'll see that if we had a, a media that wasn't, frankly, you know, let's be honest about it, the enemy of the people, you would hear about this. These would be news items all the time. Instead, the 10th Amendment Center, you know, tries their best to get this information out to us. And, you know, I don't have any conspiracy theory behind why we don't find out about things like this, but, but let's say if I did the theory would be a lot, something like this, that 
if we were to find out exactly how much local resistance is happening out there in the country, it might give us the wrong ideas from the regime's point of view. So better for us to have to dig around for it on the internet. So I have a couple questions. The first one is for Tom. You talked briefly about how a lot of the black community is refusing to get vaccinated. And do you think some of this draws from some of the governmental atrocities committed, like the Tuskegee experiment? Yeah, I I think so. But I think also, I don't know, I think there's also a kind of an, despite the fact that you know, it's it, we think, geez, the black community should not vote the way it votes, and, and and it's not they're not helping themselves. But there is nevertheless an independent streak in the black community that can't be counted out. And I think this is an example of it. That you, you, if everybody in the world tells me that, well, you, you you know, if a bunch of pointy heads tell me that I have to go do something, I think for some reason there's just some cultural inclination to say, well. Now I'm just not doing it, okay? <laughs> now I'm just not doing it. And I, I just love that. Now I'm not good. And, and isn't there a meme out there where, I don't know, is it a penguin? or It's a penguin, and it's, and it's something that maybe the penguin might have been inclined to do, and then the penguin's being ordered to do it, and the meme is, well, now I'm just not doing it. So I think there is a, a spirit of resistance that probably would have been there without the Tuskegee experiments. But what's the other one? So my second and final question is, There's been new sheets coming out over the past few days of the most popular trades and options that politicians are using. Hmm. And one of the most popular ones have been Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and Moderna. This has been pretty clearly covered up. I mean, there's other instances over the past few years of politicians doing it, but it's become much more apparent over the pandemic. How do we tell the average Joe or someone who might not be familiar with our movement that this is happening? How do we inform them on this? I mean, I, you know, look, all we can do is use the means we have. All we can do is that. And, and incidentally, I'm not giving investment advice here. But, you know, in the short run, I get why people would want to invest in Pfizer from a, a financial point of view. I get it. It's a pandemic. Pfizer comes out with a vaccine. They're going to sell a lot of it. Your stock, I, you know, I get it. But I wonder in the long run, if then we start reading about, well, after four months, it's not really clear how, you know, maybe you need a booster and that'll mean more sales, but there's not a lot of evidence that the booster is going to do anything. Like, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, may, maybe it, it does shoot right up, but I wonder if it's a long way down after this. So I'm not even so sure you're going to be satisfied with that in the long run. But uh, what do you think, Jeff? Well, uh, somebody's making a, a stock market index that just simply weights the members of Congress's own personal portfolio. So you might want to look into that, young man. We got time for one more question, one more this evening. This is going to be complicated. Human nature is complicated, as we know. Uh, I've heard people talk about revolution or revision. I've heard that Hoppy, years ago, I swear I heard him say, open borders. And yet I've heard somebody up there say we're too big and we need to be several smaller countries, which I could, but that involves borders. And then what kind of a government would these different nations have if it shouldn't have a representative republic? Because I've heard that disclaimed. Well, I guess you're asking what would it look like if this were to happen? I think it would look very different than what we've got today. I think it would look better and what we've got today. I mean, we know what we've got today, and we know where it's headed. And of course, the tough questions, the really tough questions, are things like nuclear weapons. What would we do with those? What would we do with federal land? What would we do with federal debt? What would we do with federal military bases and soldiers? You know, those are very, very difficult questions, which I suspect could be solved by forming basically a defensive compact or something among these new countries just out of self interest. For instance, uh, we'd have a, a self-interest in free trade and travel. We could go see our long-lost relatives, Hunter, in California with our passports if they'd let us in. So I don't, I don't know what it would look like, but I think it would, uh, it would probably, you know, wh- who would know what Yuga- the former Yugoslavia would look like? They went through a lot of pain. Unfortunately, Bill Clinton didn't make things better over there, but they're probably better now devolving into some countries which are based a little bit more along natural, ethnic or linguistic or religious or cultural lines. I mean, people don't like to hear that, but I think that's, that's better 
than an artificial Iraq, for example, that's better than an artificial Yugoslavia, that's better than an artificial Catalonia in Spain. So I think right now we have an artificial United States. I just want to say something that I want to make sure I say before we finish today, and that is I don't, I don't collect any kind of salary or anything from the Mises Institute or anything like that, but I, I care very deeply about what happens to it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that means, but... Um, <laughs> but I, ca- I care about it very much. I've, I first came to the uh, a Mises Institute program back in 1993, and it did an, an enormous amount to shape my worldview and to, to set me on the, the path that I've been on ever since. And every time I'm at one of these supporter summits, I am genuinely, and Jeff didn't put me up to this, I'm genuinely filled with gratitude because it's not really fashionable to be part of our cause. And for folks who have done well in life, most such people just don't want to rock the boat. You know, I'll give some money to the March of Dimes. I'll give, you know, just so I can, you know, keep up appearances, but I'm not going to touch anything that's too radical because I don't want to rock the boat. I've done very well in the current system. But the people in this room can see ahead with their mind's eye to a better system, and they're willing to support that even in the darkest of times. And people like that are just irreplaceable gems. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I think a lot of you will join us for brunch tomorrow, but some of you have to move on with your travel plans. Uh, We really appreciate your taking the time to spend a weekend with us. We really appreciate the donations. We we view you as part of our family. And uh, I hope that a lot of you saw that we we are planning to be in Vienna in October of next year for the 40th anniversary of the Mises Institute. And we would love to see each and every one of you there. So thank you so much. Have a great evening. All right, folks, if you're wondering when are you going to get to see and hear the 2000th episode, well, it's coming up. We're at 1995 right now. We have some work to do on it, but it will be released in the ordinary course of time. I strongly urge viewing. This is one of the times, one of the rare times that I say to my YouTube people, you're on the right track. Stick with YouTube for this one because a lot of what made that night special is visual. For example, Doc Dixon's Magic Act and so on. These things are are visual. So you're probably going to want to watch that one. But if you can't or you're in the car and you still want something to listen to, there's still plenty of great content on it. Uh, But we'll just edit that appropriately so that you're not being told to listen to something that it makes no sense to listen to. So that is coming. Expect it in the normal course of things. And of course, I'll be sending out an email to my newsletter list, particularly about this, because I think you're really going to enjoy watching it. And just to see an event pulled off like this with 2,500 attendees, all of whom are enthusiastic and excited and glad to be meeting each other, it's encouraging at a time of increasing darkness. So stay tuned for that, folks. It's coming soon. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.